Today's PSA comes from Cedartown, Georgia. This young man is Logan Moore. He has a condition known as hypotonia, which gives low muscle tone and it affects motor skills like walking. His parents, Christian and Justin, didn't know if their insurance were going to cover the son's walker, so they searched online and found a do-it-yourself model that they could put together themselves. So they went to their local Home Depot, showed the plans to one of the managers and said, we need to build this for our son. And the manager looked over the plans and said, okay, uh, you guys go get some ice cream and come back. So they did that and the employees actually put it together. Amen? But what was so great about it was that when they went to pay, everyone said, no, 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 no. This is on us. Right? So they got a brand new walker for free. And then after about two weeks, they found out that the insurance was going to cover the walker anyway probably because this was on the local news and they didn't want to look bad, amen? You know how that happens when they say no, but then you, you talk to the investigative reporter and he files your story, and next thing you know, they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to take care of you. So this is what happened in Cedartown, Georgia. You know, it gives me hope and encouragement when there's so many instances of bad news going around in the world today, right? There was a shooting on Friday, and there's always stuff going on, but it's nice to know that there are still people out there who recognize the need and not only are able to meet that need, but more than willing to do it out of the kindness of their heart. Amen? Amen. Now, if I can get Home Depot to come cut my grass, that would just be great. But hats off to the employees of Home Depot in Cedartown, Georgia. Amen? All right. Today's sermon is what my wife would call a tangent. Um, but next week, we'll get back to 1 Thessalonians. The title of this sermon is called, When It's Time to Let Go. When It's Time to Let Go. I'm going to pray and then read the text and it'll all make sense. Lord, we thank you once again for another time to come together. We praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, we ask you to meet us here in this place, that you would fill this place with your presence, Lord, and that you would speak to each and every one of us, all of us collectively as your sons and daughters gathered here together, and each of us excuse me, each of us, Lord, personally, as your child, seeking to hear from you. We pray, Lord Jesus, if there be anything that would be a hindrance to any of us, that you would put it out of our minds, under our feet, so we all could be fully focused and attentive to what you are saying to the church today. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter 25, verses 5 through 11. This is good King Amaziah. The Bible says, Then Amaziah assembled the men of Judah and set them by their father's houses under the commanders of thousands and of hundreds for all of Judah and Benjamin. He mustered those 20 years old and upward and found that they were 300,000 choice men, fit for war, able to handle spear and shield. He hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God came to him and said, O king, do not let the army of Israel go for you, for the Lord is not with Israel, with all these Ephraimites. But go, act, be strong for battle. Why should you suppose that God will cast you down before the enemy? For God has the power to help or to cast down. And Amaziah said to the man of God, 
But what shall we do about the hundred talents that I have given to the army of Israel? The man of God answered, The Lord is able to give you much more than this. Then Amaziah discharged the army that had come with him from Ephraim to go home again. And they became very angry with Judah and returned home in fierce anger. But Amaziah took courage, led out his people, and went to the Valley of Salt and struck down 10,000 men of Seir. Amen? That's Second Chronicles chapter 25, verses 5 to 11. Amen. Let me set this timer so I don't go over today. Um, as I said, the title of this message is, When It's Time to Let Go. And some things happened this week that really impressed upon me the importance of understanding about letting go. You know, we hear often in Christian circles, let go and let God. But we don't actually take the time to really understand what that meant and what it should mean for each and every one of us. Here, Amaziah counted his troops, realized he had a strong army, but he wanted a stronger army, so he paid a hundred talents of silver to add to his army. But the man of God came to the king and said, hey, don't let those, those troops go with you because God is not with them. And his response was, I've just paid them all this money. What about the money? And the, the prophet had to remind him that God can give you much more than that. Right? You just have to let that go. Right? And he dismissed those troops. And those troops, surprisingly, they were angry. Right? And here's the thing that I, I found interesting about that is, okay, you've already been paid, so why would you be mad? You got paid to do a job for nothing. You don't have to do the job. You still keep the money, but they were mad, right? And these are the things we want to break down today. Recognizing that sometimes we hold on to things that are holding us back, right? You know, like, I'm still mad at Shelly from something she did 20 years ago when we first got married, right? You're just holding on to that, just, just bubbling. Oh, I'm still mad. It's time to let that go, right? Or in other instances where we, um, we build an image of ourselves based on things. You know, yesterday, um, Shelly and I, after getting her car serviced, we went to the movies and we saw the live action version of Aladdin. And um, I was kind of skeptical because I like the cartoons. I'm a big cartoon guy. But for a live action movie, it was pretty good, right? And you know, if you know the story of Aladdin, he wanted to win the princess's heart, but he didn't have anything, so the genie made him a rich, rich prince, right? And the genie was trying to explain to him, you know, at some point, you have to tell her the truth, right? But he was like, no, no, no. I mean, she, she likes me for who I am, and I am all this, right? But that caused the world of trouble. And at some point in your life, you have to recognize that you are not the sum of all the things you acquired, how much money you have, what car you drive, all these things. You are who you are because God made you who you are. All those things may be nice, but that is not who you actually really are. And when you start to build yourself into, I am this person because I have these things, you're actually defeating yourself. Because then what happens if those things are taken away? Right? What happens if the money runs out? What happens if the car breaks down? What happens like, okay, 
your hearing goes, then you have to start wearing hearing aids. Does that mean you're not the same person because you're dependent on these things? This is a question that you have to ask yourself. So point number one is when is it time to let go? Right? When, you le when do you leave the past in the past? When do you stop reaching back thinking that that's going to propel you forward? Genesis chapter 19, verses 15 and 26, is a passage we all should be familiar with. It's when God gave judgment to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says, as the morning dawned, the two angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful for him, they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as he brought him out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lord, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of that city was called Zoar. And the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now the angel was pretty specific when he said, escape and don't look back. You just forget about all this stuff because judgment is about to come, right? And unfortunately for her, she couldn't let it go. She looked back, right? And because she didn't let it go and look back, she became a pillar of salt, right? Sometimes we actually spend more time thinking about the things that we have left behind than appreciating the things that God has put into our lives right here and now. God wants us to wake up and not look back. You know, in the morning, when you are blessed to open your eyes, the first thing that comes through your mind should not be, did you, what happened yesterday? I can't believe that happened to me. You know, yesterday is gone. That is then. Today is a new day. And no matter what happened yesterday, today is a day that you can just move beyond yesterday. But we get caught up and trapped into continually looking back, always looking over our shoulder, thinking that the more you look back, you're going to fix it. No, you, we can't change the past. One person who probably can change the past is God, but he has it fixed to be the way it is, so we need to not look back, right? Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 62 says this. As they, this is being Jesus and the disciples, were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back 
is fit for the kingdom of God. Right? Is that, is that me? Is that you? Is that us? Where God is saying, follow me, and we're saying, okay, hold, hold on, guys. Let me get this straight. Then I will come and follow you. Now, don't get me wrong. There are, there are good times when you should look back. For example, if I'm cooking like I normally do, and the phone rings and it's one of my kids that I haven't talked to in a while, you know, I might get involved in a conversation. Then I might have to think, did I leave that pot on the stove, right? Then, yeah, I should go back and make sure it's off. Because if I don't, I might have a fire in the present, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that you can't change, that you keep looking back, thinking, if I'd have only done this, if I'd have only done that, right? If I would have been nicer to that person, maybe they would have liked me enough to go on a date. You know what? You can't go back and change that. That person is gone someplace else. So you have to stop looking back thinking, man, maybe I can make another first impression. No, first is first. If you go back, you're making a second impression, which may not even work, right? You have to appreciate what God is doing in your life right now and not keep looking back, right? You know, we had the... Uh, meeting with my wife's uh, retirement planner and um, basically what happens is they tell you how much money you save and at least at her company they they give you two options they can roll over your savings into an account where the value can go up and down over the course of your remaining life after work or they can make a deal with you and say, okay, for the rest of your life, you sign this over to us and we're going to give you 3000 5000 whatever it is, dollars a month, every month for the rest of your life, right? Sounds pretty good, amen? But you can't at that moment say, man, if I would only save more, I could get more because it's too late. The value now is the value now. You can't go back, put some more money in, and then come to the meeting and say, okay, it's more. So does that mean I'll get more? What that means is now you have the option of taking one deal or the other, and whichever way it goes, then it's up to you to budget your present lifestyle so that money that you're going to get each month is going to last you for the rest of your life. That's what it means. You can't keep going back saying, man, if I'd have done this and done this, I'd be set on easy street. And don't get me wrong, I'm thinking that way myself. I'm like, man, if I would have just started saving five years earlier, I would have even more money. But I don't have a time machine, so I can't go back in the past, change my saving options five years ago, and then jump to the future so the money will be more, right? I have to just appreciate the fact that I was saving. There is some money saved. And when I retire, or when she retires, or when we both retire, there'll be some income coming in, right? You have to thank God for what you have. Not keep going back, trying to change things. Because sometimes when you're looking back, you lose sight of what's right in front of you. Amen? John, chapter 7. This is a passage we all should know. Verse 53, chapter 7 to chapter 8, verse 11. The Bible says, Then they each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. 
Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was finally left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. Right? I love that passage. Because in it, Jesus is saying, I don't care about what happened in the past. I'm going to deal with you from right here and now. And I'm asking you, don't keep doing the things that you used to do that got you in this situation in the first place. Go and sin no more. It's time to let your old life go and live a new life in Christ, right? That's what this passage means. It's time to let that old lifestyle go. All the things you used to do that you used to enjoy, it's time to let those things go, right? You know, the Bible says in Romans that there are things we used to do that we enjoy, but now we're ashamed of because we know the end of those things was death. But now God has given us a new life in Christ, and we have to let those things go. Sometimes we are the ones holding ourselves back because we're still trying to hold on to an old lifestyle. We're still trying to hold on to a dream that went away 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? Some parents right now, they're trying to relive their lives through their children. And they have to understand, look, your, your life is your life. Your child now is your own unique person. Let your child be your child. And when your child makes a mistake, that, that's your child. He has to learn from that. For example, I can see it because he's not here. Uh, our youngest child, you guys know, Jonathan, uh, when he got his first car, in two months, he totaled that car, right? You guys remember? We told you. Then he got another car because he's on our insurance, right? And just two weeks ago, I had told him, you know, son, I'm proud of you. You've had this car for two years. You, you've had incident-free driving. You're adulting. I'm happy for you. He said, thanks, Dad, right? Yesterday... Um, my wife says to me while I'm working, finishing the sermon, I don't know all the details, but Jonathan had an accident. Right? And I remember how I was before and how I handled it yesterday. Before, I was like, how can that boy, you just got that car. Right? Yesterday, I'm like, well, you know what? He's a grown man. He's going to have to figure that out for himself. You gave him the insurance stuff, he's going to have to deal with AAA on his own because he's a grown person. So I shouldn't have to try to relive my life through Jonathan. But a lot of parents do that. You know, it's nice to want your kids to do a lot of different things, but make sure you're doing those things because your kid wants to do those things, not because you want to do those things. You didn't get a chance to do it when you were a kid, so you're going to make sure your kid did it. What if your kid doesn't like that, right? What if your kid wants to be a musician when you wanted your kid to be a doctor? You have to let that go. Your kid is a different person, right? Just like I have to let it go. Hey, you know what? 
This is what I told Shelley. Well, he's going to have to increase his amount of insurance payment he makes to us because this is definitely going to increase our insurance, and I'm not paying for that. Right? But I wasn't mad about it because, you know, Johnson has a job. He's going to have to figure it out for himself. Or I could just keep being mad that I'm cheating myself. Just sometimes you have to let stuff go. Right? I hope somebody's hearing me. I know I'm hearing myself. Two. God is able. You know, we hear people say that. But do you really actually know that? God is able. The prophet said to the king, God is able to give you much more than that, much more than a hundred talents. Is that all you think? God, do, is your understanding of God so limited that you don't think God can give you more than a hundred talents? Right? You know, when I was younger in the faith, and I would hear people testify about what God did and how God delivered them and all this stuff. You know, that sounds good. And you say to yourself, I want that. You know, I got problems right now. But you don't see your problems being solved just like that. And you begin to doubt and wonder. And then you find yourself in a bad way and then boom, God actually comes in and delivers you then you know that God is able. And that's the thing that we all have to come to an understanding for ourselves. Because what God did for me is not going to mean anything to you. It sounds nice, but you have to know that God is able personally for your own situation. Because when you know that for yourself, you will just keep walking in faith until God moves. Amen? All right. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 6 to 15, the Bible says, Abraham going quickly into the tent said to Sarah, Quick, three seeds of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am old and worn out, and my Lord is old, shall I have this pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, nay, but you did laugh. Right? Now, don't get me wrong. I can understand what Sarah is saying. I'm older. I've gone through the chains. It's not biologically possible for me to have a child. Right? So I don't see that happening. But God said, is there anything too hard for God? Sarah, don't you know God is able? I am the one who invented biology. I can just transform you right now if I wanted to, right? You have to know that God is able, right? Just like I have peace about Jonathan's accident because I know God is able to work that out. It's not up to me to figure it out for him. What my focus should be is on Shelly, retirement, saving, right? Because 
we're going into that empty nest. That's where my focus should be. It should also be right here in friendship, right? Now, if I didn't know God was able, then I would be calling Mike saying, Mike, I know you wanted to preach after you got this stuff done on the property, but I can't do it right now. I got a big problem with this kid and this retirement and da 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 I just can't do it, right? I just need to quit. But I know God is able. Whatever problem that he presents to me, he also, as I mentioned last week, there's a way of escape, right? There is no temptation that's common to anybody. We all have problems. But with the problem, God presents a way out. And sometimes the way out is just going through, right? And if you know he's able, you can go through because you know he's going to be right here with me. So if that means I have to keep my hand on the steering wheel and maybe close my eyes, but I'm going to get through. Because God is actually the one in the driver's seat. I just may be the one holding the steering wheel, but he's working through me. And if he says, about this time... Shelly's going to have a kid. I might say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, God. We don't need any more kids. How about you have our kids give us grandchildren so we can send them back? But God is able to fix it, whatever it is. That's what we have to know. You have to know that he's able. And one of the reasons that Christians today are not living victoriously, and I'm not talking about being rich. Victorious living does not equate to having a lot of money. Victorious living means when a problem comes, oh, I take that blow. Oh, I take that blow. And then God builds me back up and I just keep moving forward. That's victorious living. Like Mike mentioned about the boxing match. Got up, boom! And now he's the champ because he was able to take that blow and take that blow and then give a blow back, right? And Satan, you know, old Slick, that's what he likes is to give and dish out punishment over and over and over because his hope is, well, I can't stop them because they're saved, but maybe I can discourage them and they'll just quit and become ineffective. But when you know God is able, you're saying to yourself, no, I am not going to quit. I'm just going to keep on pressing on. Like Jakey's, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to let go until you bless I'm just going to hold on. So yeah, you, oh, my hip is out. I'm still going to hold on because I know God is able. That's what we have to know. And when you know that, everything changes. Doesn't matter what's happening all around you because you know God is in control. Amen? Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I do not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you and make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What Job is saying was that for all this time, You had the hedge around me, but I didn't really understand. But then you allowed the hedge to go away, and Satan came and gave me blow after blow after blow, right? First, my camels and my wealth and my sheep were obliterated. Oh, okay, but my family's still intact. Then all my children, all ten children, seven sons and three daughters, killed. Oh, my goodness. Okay, okay, but I'm still alive, all right. Then the devil came again. Sores, 
boils. Oh, this is just miserable. I can't even move without being in pain. But I found out, even in the midst of all of that, God is still on the throne. And come on, let's be real. Most of us would probably quit after the money. And very few of us would make it when the kids were gone. Some of us might be happy, though, right? Oh, no more car wrecks. But then when he attacks your body, oh, my goodness, and you can't move without being in pain, you might be like Elijah and say, Lord, that's enough. I just quit. I'm the only one here doing your will. I quit. And God had to remind him, man, are you out of your mind? I got 7,000 who have not bent the knee to bail. You're not the only one. And what does that tell us? That tells us that we have to encourage one another because we are not the only ones going through trials. Everybody has trials. We just wear it differently, right? And some of us are living more victorious than others because they have a smile on their face no matter what the trial is. Others, they got a big frown and you're like, oh, I ain't going near that brother. That brother going through, he got a woo-hoo, well, no. God bless you, right? We want to live victoriously. Matthew 19, verse 16 to 26, the Bible says, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I have to gain eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. However, if you were to enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these I've kept. I'm, on, I'm over that. I'm all over that. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away very sorrowful, for he had great possession. Oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do it, God. Oh, no, 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 no. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things. All things are possible. Right? You just have to know that God is able, and you have to take God at his word and believe that he is who he said that he is. And you have to know that whatever problems you're facing, God is bigger than the problem. Right? We shortchange ourselves because we think the problem is so big and God is so small. Think about that. Yesterday, I noticed in my bathroom, on my side, there were two ants just going about their business. And see, in, in the bathroom, she has her side, I have my side, you know, the basins. And then on my side, it's close to the tub, so I sit there and I put my hearing aids on. And as I was doing that, that's when I saw the two ants. Now, you know, most people would say, oh, there's an ant! Right? I don't actually do that. I sat and watched those ants for about five minutes, right? They just talked to each other, go back, went around, came back. And you know what I realized? The ants are only concerned about what is right in front of them. 
They could care less about anything else. They're on a mission to go out, find food, go back to the colony and say, hey, I found some toothpaste on his side of the bathroom. Don't go to her side, go to his side, and then you can just load up on toothpaste and bring it back. That's how ants work, right? And it reminded me, we need to get back to that. Be only concerned about what God is doing for you in and around and through you and stop worrying about the other stuff. Right? What did Jesus say? There's enough problems for today that will take care of itself. Yesterday will take care of itself. God knows what you have need of. Right? So seek ye first what? The stuff? Time is about up. No, seek ye first the kingdom of God. All right. I got three minutes. Here's the thing that got me thinking. In the passage, he said, send those people home. Don't let them go with you because God is not with them. He said, okay. But what about the... Don't worry about it. God is able to give you more than that, Right? But they were very angry that they were being dismissed. And my question is, why? Why are you mad because you don't have to do the job that I paid you for? Now, I don't know about you, but if someone paid me to do something, and then they said, you don't have to do it, but here, here's your pay, I'm going to say thank you very much. Right? I'm going to say thank you and go on to my next job. But some people are not that way. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 through chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says, when God saw what they did, they being the Ninevites, how they turned from the evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Really? And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my country? That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Let me stop right there. Think about what Jonah is saying. The reason I ran away from you when you called me was because I knew you were a great, merciful God. And I didn't want to come here because I knew if these people repented, then you would show them mercy. And so now that they have repented, they went on a, a fast, right? And even the king wore sackcloth. God relented and said, hey, you know what? They repented, so I'm not going to blow them up. And Jonah is saying, just kill me because I'm so upset, I want to die. Think about that. When you became saved, did people get so mad because you changed your life? Or were they happy for you? Now, this is not a heathen. This is a prophet. He should be thankful that God is showing mercy. And he said, just kill me because you were merciful. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry, Jonah? Jonah went out of the city and sat in the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under a shade to see what would become of the city. Now the Lord appointed a plant and it made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the dawn came up the next day, the Lord appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, is it better for me to die than to live? But God said again to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, this great city, that there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? And also much cattle? Come on, Jonah. You're valuing plants over people? 
over souls? And you're a prophet of God? Is that how we are? We are so mad that God changed someone around that we stopped going to church? Think about that. Let's say Snoop Dogg walked through the door, sat down, and said, Church, I gave my life over to Christ. Shouldn't we be happy for Snoop Dogg? Right? Or Miley Cyrus, shouldn't we be happy if she stopped acting crazy and gave her life to the Lord? Or should we say, no, 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 you get out of here. Don't come in here. If you're going to come in here, I'm going to kill myself. Come on now, church. All right, I'm running out of time. Let me wrap this up. Matthew 20, 1 through 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning and hired laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. After going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You too, go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others still standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said, You too, go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they were angry and grumbled at the master of the house, saying, Those that worked last only worked an hour, and yet... You have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree to work with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to choose what I with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Are you mad at God because he saved someone that you didn't like? Right? Is that how it is? Here's the thing. When I entered into a relationship with God, he said to me, if you believe, you will receive eternal life. You will also have an abundant life here now but eternity is your goal, right? So to break it down, when I agreed to become the pastor of this church, Friendship Community Church, right? God did not say, become the pastor now, and in five years, this church will have 10,000 people. He did not say that, right? He said, I want you to go to that church week after week after week preaching the true, unadulterated gospel. And if you do that, I will say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right? And I said, I take that deal. I gladly take that deal. Now, if I start watching TV and looking at all these other churches with 10 and 20 and 30,000 people, and say, how come you didn't do that for me? God's going to remind me and say, did you not sign up to be the pastor of Friendship Community Church? Did I not promise you that I would take care of you and your family and that you will live with me eternally? Did you not agree to that? And I will say, yes, Lord. Then he will say, why are you begrudging my generosity? Because I blessed that other guy then I'm going to repent in sackcloth and ashes and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Because you kept your word. And I start looking elsewhere as opposed to just looking what's right in front of me. This is what he wants us to understand. Stop looking over there. Look right in front of you. Read your Bible and look what God is doing in your life right now. Amen? Whew, okay. 
John 7, 14 and 24 says this. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not my own, but him who sent me. If anyone will is to do God's will, he will know whether or not the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking of my own authority. The one who speaks of his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, that is not from Moses, but from the fathers, and yet you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath man sees, a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man whole by healing his body? Do not judge appearances, but judge with right judgment. Are you so caught up on the letter of the law that you're mad at me because I healed a man on the Sabbath? Really? Are you so mad with God because he blessed someone that you didn't think deserved that blessing? You know what? They may not have deserved that blessing. Truth be told, none of us deserve any of the blessings. But God still blesses us. Right? He still blesses us. I realized one thing yesterday. I don't deserve the wife that I have. She is too much for me. Right? I don't. She's a nice person. I'm not. She's considerate. I'm so-so. Right? But God told her, hey, that's your guy right there. And she said, okay, God, even though he's gruffy, I'll take him. <laughs> right? I don't deserve it. But he did it anyway. And if you look at your own life and look at yourself in the mirror, you will realize you don't deserve the blessing you have, but he still did it anyway. Because that's how God is. And you should know that some people are just going to be mad because you're being blessed. That's just how people are. And here's the thing. Don't get mad. Just tell them, you know what? God will bless you too if you turn your life over to him. It's not me. It's him. God is not a respecter of person. He wants to bless everybody. But everyone is not obeying God. That's why they're not getting the blessing. That's why. You, you know, there's no secret handshake combination to get God's blessing. God will bless who he wants to bless. The secret is real simple. It's right there in the Bible. Just trust and obey him. That's all. And he will open out the windows of heaven. Amen? All right. A new life. That's what he gave us. A new life. Not the old life that he told us to come out from. He gave us a new life. In him. With new blessings. All he asks is that we. Actually act like it. Act like you have a new life. Don't keep doing the same old stuff. That you used to do. The stuff that you renounced when you came over to him. Don't look back. Move forward. Let me close on this. The Bible says in Romans, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that we were buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You know what that means? That means that our old life, we die to it. We just said no more. We put it in the casket and we buried it. And now we have a new life in Christ. 
But some of us are still holding on to the old life. Let that life go. It's been time to let it go. God has so much of a life waiting for you. And you're missing out because you're still holding on, looking back. Like, well, what if I give this up? God is able to give you more than that. Well, if I change God, people are going to be mad. He's all that you need. And you know what? He's going to give you new people. He's not going to leave you out there by yourself. He's going to bring new people into your life. People who actually care about you. Not people who want to stay with you as long as they get something from you. You know, like those soldiers. Yeah, I'll fight for you, bro, as long as you're paying me. But when you stop, then I'm going to go away. No, God will send you people who will be committed to you. Thick and thin, they'll be right there. Even when you and them don't agree. If I could just pick on Mike for one second. This brother has been by my side from day five. He didn't really know me at day one through four. But once he figured me out, he's been right there. And when he has to rebuke me, he just does it. But I know it's because he cares about me. He cares about my wife and my children, and he prays for me. I know of times when it's just been me and Mike in this place praying. God will send you people like that, not people who run away at the first time of struggle. Oh, you got sin in your life. Let me get away from you. No. Walk in the new life that God has blessed you with. Let go of the old life. Walk in a new life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for another time to be together. Lord, we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. Do your name for all the wonderful things that you've done in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your word, which enlightens us and teaches us that you are able to do all things. There's nothing too hard for you. And help us to know that, Lord, when we face seemingly insurmountable problems, because we know in faith that you are bigger than any problem that we face. We thank you. We praise you. Let all who agree say amen. amen. Woo! God is good. Amen? God is so good. And I, I love God. I love being the pastor here. I love sharing his word. I also love the fact that there's some good food over there in the parsonage that I'm going to partake of. I don't know about you, but I'm going over there. Amen? Uh, the praise team is going to come, they're going to sing, and then we'll be dismissed, and uh, we'll fellowship in the parsonage. Amen.